who wishes to make a statement. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Apologies for not uh, being in the uh, chamber just at the very outset. Tricky getting used to this new system. Um, but we're here today to talk about the opportunities that exist for a new green growth strategy and delivery framework. It's hard to imagine a set of circumstances that has had such a global, devastating global impact as those we currently face. In recent months, the COVID-19 pandemic has dealt a swift and a cruel blow with the loss of many lives. It has single-handedly brought countries, economies and people to a standstill across the world. As we work out how to manage and ultimately defeat the immediate and ongoing threat it poses, as in most areas of our lives, the answer to this crisis will involve sustainability, specifically economic, social and environmental sustainability at the heart of everything we do. Recent months have proved challenging for everyone. There is no blueprint for a pandemic or one single plan that fits all circumstances. We have tried and will continue to try to do our best for the people of Northern Ireland, based on the evidence and information available to us. The public have been very understanding and have sacrificed a great deal to implement the strict conditions we had to introduce to prevent the spread of the disease. We owe them a great deal of gratitude. Thanks to their resolve and their actions, we have seen a significant fall in transmissions in cases of COVID-19 and of deaths due to the disease. And so we have been able to introduce greater freedoms. This exemplifies what can be achieved with clear leadership and a willingness to work together to a common good. I firmly believe that even in the darkest times, we have a duty to plan for the future, and this is no exception. The COVID-19 pandemic, despite the pain and suffering it has caused, has forced us to live and work differently, to think differently and behave differently. Around the world, people are traveling less, using less energy finding new ways to communicate, to socialise, to work and to learn. At the same time, there have been tremendous benefits for the environment at both the micro and macro levels that we can all recognise. And as we plan our recovery from the effects of this pandemic, it is crucial that we adopt a holistic approach, building on the many uh, lessons learned in recent months. Rather than picking up where we left off, I am recommending economic renewal. Renewal, which recognises the importance of our environment and which advocates green growth as a pathway towards a sustainable future. Speaking with members from all parties and with people from across Northern Ireland, it is clear how much we value our environment. This has never been more important than in recent months. People have longed for the opportunity to escape the confines imposed by COVID and engage with nature. For many of us, this interaction with our natural environment has sustained, uh, has sustained us through the break lockdown. For further evidence, all you need to do is talk to the people who make the five million trips to our forest parks each year. I share the appreciation of nature, which is why I have asked for sustainability to be placed at the heart of everything that DERA does. It is also why I believe that if we understand the value of the environment, our natural capital, the real challenges which we face, can become an opportunity to benefit everyone. So my message today is one of revolution, revolution in our economy, a revolution which, if embraced, will benefit our businesses, our people and our environment. In Northern Ireland, we have not always been handed the resources available to other parts of the world. Say the coal or the oil that drove the industrial um, revolution. Instead, we have been blessed with a rich and fertile land which feeds us and sustains our well-being. These same natural assets attract hundreds of thousands of visitors every year and feeds millions of people in the UK and across the world. They come because of the beauty of our landscape and the welcome they receive. Our exports grow because we can compete with the best in the world. We must look after both if we are to continue to survive and prosper. We have always used anything we have to good effect and have as a result made a greater impact on the world stage than one would expect for our size, geographic location or history. Knowing how to make the best use of what we have is ingrained in us and is a trait which will help us to recover from COVID and serve us well into the future. So why do I say this? <clears throat> our economy is changing. Over the next 30 years, it will be unrecognisable. There are many reasons for this. 
Perhaps the single most important of these is the commitment by the UK Government to achieve net zero carbon by 2050. Now, I am not somebody who is prone to declaring climate emergencies or promoting panic, but I do recognise the value of data and evidence. It is irrefutable that globally greenhouse gas emissions are increasing. In the UK and Northern Ireland, we have managed to reduce our emissions since 1990, but the big picture means we need more. In 2018, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change IPCC, stated in a special report that limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius would require rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. The new UK net zero target will deliver on that commitment to reduce emissions. Overall, we have reduced our emissions in Northern Ireland by 18 per cent in recent years. We have gone down from emitting 24 megatons of carbon dioxide in 1990 to 20 megatons in 2017. And while this is not enough, it proves that we can make progress when we work together. Average global temperatures have increased and will continue to rise unless there is a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. This will have far-reaching consequences for sea level rise, biodiversity, extreme weather and other factors that impact on our society. And whether or not you or I accept these reports and predictions, reducing emissions will have significant economic opportunities and societal benefits. <clears throat> For example, in 2019, the UK Government estimated there were more than 430,000 green collar jobs in the UK, and this figure could rise to 2 million by 2030. It is important to understand how these benefits come about. First, we must stop squandering our resources. Preventing waste is fundamental to better productivity and more sustainable economic growth. When we waste energy, um, we produce avoidable greenhouse gas emissions. When we waste assets like food and fill up landfills, we produce greenhouse gas emissions. While we waste nutrients in our food production system, we pollute our water, damage ecosystems and reduce biodiversity. And when we fail to support people, to develop a connection with their environment, we waste human potential, possibly the most damaging of all. But when we treat energy, biological diversity, material resources and people as assets that they are, we begin to see what is possible. I will give you three examples of this. The first of these is agri-food industry. Essentially, we have created an asset which is the envy of many economies across the world. The asset benefits everyone in terms of providing high quality foods, jobs and exports, which bring in valuable revenue streams. The industry is worth some 4.9 billion in sales, supports up to 100,000 jobs and feeds up to 10 million people. Imagine the scale of that for a moment. Here we are in this small place, using our natural capital and the skills and expertise of our people to feed a global megacity the size of London. Furthermore, as an employer, our agri-food industry creates opportunities to attract homegrown talent in the form of highly developed, talented and educated young people. Of course, this scale does bring challenges, not least in the terms of the environment, challenges which can and will be addressed. Ultimately, however, this will be achieved by making the industry more sustainable and profitable. For example, despite progress in reducing phosphorus in our rivers, water quality remains a problem, and the picture in the marine environment is similar for nitrogen. Both cost our environment and us dearly. Northern Ireland water is the single largest energy consumer in the country, but this is because our water has become polluted due to a range of contributing factors, not limited just to agriculture. So by minimising the wasteful escape of nutrients into our water, we not only protect habitats and biodiversity, but increase productivity and save in energy costs. At this point, though, I want to recognise the enormous contribution that farmers are making to safeguarding and improving our environment. My department has been running environmental schemes since 1988. The current EFS was established in 2017, and farmers have enthusiastically responded, signing up in large numbers. To date, almost 5,000 farmers are participating in the scheme, and more will follow. In the first two tranches, EFS has delivered over a quarter of a million new trees which will absorb well over 100,000 tonnes of carbon over their lifetime. EFS has also delivered over 200 miles of new hedgerows, 
which in addition to capturing carbon, <coughs> is a haven for birds and insects and improves our biodiversity. EFS will also contribute significantly to improving water quality by protecting our rivers and watercourses from livestock. EFS represents a long-term investment in our environment. We have also made great strides in terms of carbon efficiency in the agri-food sector. For example, our dairy farmers have over the last 20 years reduced their greenhouse gas footprint by around 35 per cent for each litre of milk produced, and they produce 2.2 billion litres annually. Most notably, they have achieved this while growing their business through improved genetics and nutrition. More needs to be done, however, and more can be done right across our food supply chain. It is worth noting that around one-fifth of the Amazonian rainforest have been cut down in order to grow beef. If in the future this beef is imported into the UK in large quantities, it could threaten our market and people's livelihoods, as well as the global environment. It is therefore important that we understand just what we have in our agri-food industry and the role that it plays in protecting our future. We can become a global leader in the production of high-quality food from sustainable systems, and I believe that we can become a strategic food zone. We can do so by achieving a balance between feeding the world and feeding the planet. The second example is in the area of recycling. When I previously held the post of Environment Minister, household recycling rates were just over 34 per cent. That stage the received wisdom was that we could not reach 50 per cent by 2020. Since then, we have made huge progresses, progress, and I am pleased to say exceeded that target. But the circular economy and recycling are not just about a percentage. They are about economic opportunity. Recent studies have highlighted the economic potential of recycling for the Northern Ireland economy. Upwards of 13,000 jobs uh, opportunities could be created using this approach. As an example of the potential, my department provides funding to the social enterprise you saw three years ago to deal with mattresses. This project initially employed 16 people and increased annually annual recycling from 2,000 mattresses to over 60,000, and today 25 people are employed. Just three of Northern Ireland's manufacturers employing 750 people annually create £110 million in economic value for the local economy by reprocessing paper plastic and glass recyclates from our households. They have the potential to add a further £50 million to the local economy if more high-quality recyclate was available. To address this need, my department launched a £23 million capital programme last year to provide financial assistance to councils. This was designed to increase the quality of recycling. Some £3.45 million has already been allocated to projects that are estimated will deliver an additional 7,500 tonnes of recycling and over 7,800 tonnes of CO2 savings, which equates to £485,000 of carbon savings. The third example is in the area of green energy, a key policy led by my colleague Diane Dodds, Minister for the Economy. Through various means, we have achieved a position in which 45 per cent of our energy is provided from renewable sources, such as wind and solar energy. Again, this is a result that would be the envy of many countries across the world. But through further innovation and investment in renewable energy systems and storage of that energy, we can go further. And I know the Department of Economy is developing an energy strategy which will make this a reality. As I stated earlier regarding food, I also believe that Northern Ireland can become a strategic energy zone. The success of our Prosperity Agreement programme demonstrates how we can work in partnership with business to deliver significant environmental benefits. We recently signed our second Prosperity Agreement with Coca-Cola Hellenic Bottling Company, which sets targets for reducing energy and water consumption for the reduction of CO2 emissions and to increase the amount of recycled plastic in their products. The point of these examples is that even with all the challenges that we have faced in our society and our history, we know that great things are possible when we work together. We need to be seen to play a lead role. We also know that we need to set our environmental house in order, and we need to show that we in Northern Ireland have the innovation, 
the skills and the determination necessary to influence meaningful outcomes that can benefit us locally <clears throat> as well as people across the world. And that, Mr Speaker, brings me to green growth. This is a globally recognised concept, with organisations like OECD developing a set of strategic principles in their economic policies. It is not a new concept, having been the precursor of Green New Deal a decade ago in response to the global financial crisis. And while considerable progress was made back then, the concept was arguably ahead of its time, and I believe the time has come. For evidence of this, we need look no further than our neighbours in the EU. We have adopted green growth as a basis of their European Green Deal, or who have adopted green growth as a basis of their European Green Deal. It aims to transform the European Union from a high to low carbon economy, while improving people's quality of lives through cleaner air, water, and improved health. By working together across the British Isles and internationally, we can co-design a green growth strategy and delivery framework that will deliver for Northern Ireland. So green growth is about working together to value our environmental assets, growing those assets and in so doing growing our economy. These are three key elements. There are three key elements to making this work. The first element of green growth is a co-designed environmental strategy on behalf of the executive titled the Green Growth Strategy. This will be designed in collaboration with a broad and inclusive range of people from across the business community and environmental sectors and the community and voluntary sectors. Although I have characterised these as separate sectors, in reality the boundaries are not so clear. I know many people in the business community who are determined to make a difference in terms of climate change and the environment. People in the environment sector understand the importance of working with the business community to secure positive outcomes, and organisations in the community and voluntary sector know that an excellent way to empower people in communities is to connect them with their environment. It is my intention that the strategy will be discussed at the Executive with co-design and consultation during the autumn, and a strategy finalised by next spring, which brings me to the second element of green growth, namely the delivery framework. This will be a series of interconnected programmes which demonstrate green growth in action. The first of these will be key foundation programmes, exemplars of what I like to call strategy by doing. In other words, they are major objectives which will contribute to the aims of the strategy, but in a way which demonstrates real impact on the ground. For example, in March, I announced the first of these in Forest for Our Future programme aimed to plant 18 million trees over the next decade. This is the type of foundation programme what will be at the heart of what we are trying to do within green growth? Other elements to be delivered over the next 10 years and beyond are keeping plastics in the economy and out of the environment. Through this programme, all plastic which comes into Northern Ireland will remain in the economy and out of the environment. This will be much broader than but include reform of the package and producer responsibility system in line with other parts of the UK and participation in a UK-wide deposit return scheme. We will engage in both of these. Growing people's well-being and confidence through the environment. This will aim to deliver measurable and population-wide improvements in well-being. It will focus on educational, social and economic benefits associated with the connection between people and their environment, something we have truly appreciated the importance of in recent months. And sustainable growth through technology. That will involve the full rollout of broadband across Northern Ireland. This will in turn support a network of new businesses and services by connecting people and communities in Northern Ireland and across the world. Smart cities and rural economies are rural communities. We will design this programme with communities and for communities to develop, develop natural green connectors and corridors across cities, towns and landscapes, connecting people in their environment. This will also involve the use of connected technologies such as office networking tools and the Internet of Things to promote efficient energy use. Enhancing blue carbon habitats. This will involve the development of blue carbon habitats, increasing biodiversity and carbon capture. And finally, we recognise the valuable contribution agriculture already makes to our environment. However, we can continue to improve the sustainable land use, healthy rivers and growing biodiversity. This will involve comprehensive mapping of soil quality and water catchments across Northern Ireland 
in support of low carbon farming. A significant increase in our green infrastructure, for example, hedges and peatlands to sequester carbon, improve biodiversity, and act as natural barriers against pollution and flooding. New food and agricultural policies to encourage and reward businesses for sustainability and environmental outcomes. A scenario planning model to map, predict and ultimately monitor the benefits of different green growth interventions. And the movement of all sensitive sites towards favourable management, including land and marine. I would also envisage programmes in the first phase for an increase in renewable energy to a point where we become a net exporter and sustainable transport using renewable energy to achieve net zero emissions. I will be discussing these proposals with my ministerial colleagues, so we can bring them back to the Executive. We are also, of course, working with the Department for Infrastructure on adaption programmes to deal with the impact of climate change, as well as planning a significant increase in the sustainable transport. We will develop the strategy and delivery framework through a process of co-design and co-delivery, green growth will only happen if people have ownership and if all the key players work together towards a shared goal. The framework will operate under the oversight of the executive through an inter-ministerial group, which I will chair. And given the importance of green growth, I have asked the DERA Permanent Secretary to lead the development work together with officials from across the Northern Ireland Civil Service and a broad group of stakeholders. The third element of green growth is the development of proposals to address new decade, new approach. These recommendations include commitments on climate change, including legislation and the reductions of plastics waste. Mr. Speaker, at the beginning of this statement, I promised to set out the opportunities for Northern Ireland, which are possible if we work together to improve our environment, creating jobs and economic growth the green growth way. I hope that this statement gives you a flavour of these opportunities recognising that co-design means not having all of the answers in advance. We can make a difference, and we can achieve economic, environmental and social benefits if we use the right approach. Indeed, I would argue that we must to achieve these benefits together. We need a vibrant economy to provide people with meaningful work. We need to give people an opportunity to work their way out of poverty, and we need to help those people who cannot help themselves. But importantly, we need to do all this in a way that cares for and enhances our environment. Ultimately, we are part of that environment. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker and members of this House, I hope that colleagues will recognise the emphasis on partnership in this statement and the proposals it contains. They are ambitious, I grant you, but I make no apology for that, because it is what we must do and what people expect us to do. My department will work with people from across the political spectrum to make this happen, and it is my hope that members will reciprocate the spirit of partnership. While green growth will be a major challenge for all of us, I believe that with a vision of sustainability, goodwill and an evidence-based approach, we can make a huge difference to our place and the people of Northern Ireland at the heart of the next economic revolution. Thank you. We now come to a period of questions to the Minister on his statement. Uh, and as usual, some latitude is given to the Chair or Deputy Chair of the relevant committee. So I now call the Deputy Chair of the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, Philip McGuigan. Uh, last can call you. And uh, I want to thank the Minister for coming before us and making the statement today. Green growth is a highly uh, aspirational strategy, and the statement is very welcome and contains many worthwhile aims and objectives. However, based on its content, uh, what has been announced seems to be the start of a process. Uh, many of the programmes, ideas, concepts referenced in the statement aren't new and have been around a while. Uh, what is being new, I suppose, is bringing them together and appointing the permanent secretary to lead on them. Uh, what is missing is details such as budget, timeline, proper aims and objectives and delivery plans. So, Could I ask the Minister to indicate what resources he has allocated to its delivery and can he provide the ERA Committee with a detailed delivery plan, including the time frame? Well, today's um, statement is about delivering the concept. and Over the course of the next year, um, that concept, as we work with other departments and as we work with the, the Committee and indeed the, the entire House, um, will become the strategy. 
and the strategy will, will be bid for um, on the basis of what we recognise is needed uh, to move this forward. <clears throat> I think it is important um, for all of us that we do understand that environmentally this is an opportunity, not a threat to our economy, it is an opportunity to build. And that is what we want to do. We want to build our economy in a sustainable way. We want to ensure that growth happens in a sustainable way. We want to ensure that as we do things um, which help the environment and protect the environment, that we can also grow our economy side by side with that. So we will produce budgets and so forth. Now is just not uh, the time. Um, that course of work will happen uh, in due course when the strategy is more formalised. I call William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his positive statement to the House today. I welcome this roadmap for the future, in particular the need for more work to be done around the circular economy, in particular the better use of our waste material. Uh, keeping waste in our economy is a must. How do you foresee Northern Ireland delivering on this approach? Well, we, we have significant opportunities, and I referenced the £23 million fund, um, which is looking at how we can better improve um, on our waste strategy. So, achieving 50 per cent of uh, recycling rate by 2020 uh, was an admirable aim. Um, I set that policy way, way back in 2010 and was told we had a chance, we done it. Now we are looking in 2030, what can we achieve? Can we achieve 70 per cent? And that is a decision that I have to make, but it certainly would be a noble aspiration. <clears throat> achieving the 70 per cent is one thing, but actually making good utilisation of the product is another matter entirely. So, in your constituency, for example, cherry pipes recycle a lot of plastics. In, uh, for Manor South Tyrone, we have a, a, a company recycling a lot of bottles. Um, again, we have others recycling considerable amounts of paper, which is then reused once again. And all of that is absolutely critical. Um, I met three companies last week which employ 700 people in recycling, and they are keeping huge volumes of that waste in the economy in Northern Ireland. So I don't want to see recycling happen and then that material to end up being put on a ship to China, and we don't know what's happening with it. I want to see it recycled here, and it's about supporting businesses uh, to do that here and to ensure that we have that circular economy existing. Can I ask the, minis the min Minister to address the Chair? Uh, when he turns round, uh, he finds that the microphone is not picking up what, uh, all that he's saying. It may causes difficulties for Hansard. So I would ask him to urge to attempt to address the Chair at all times. And I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I thank the Minister for his statement today, and I note the timely nature, <clears throat> given the temperatures in the Arctic Circle um, have reached a record high of 38 degrees this weekend. Would he agree with me that in order to protect our natural capital for generations, we need to take action now? But we also need to ensure that we raise a generation of young people who are environmentally aware. And to this end, would he agree that green growth and climate awareness should form part of the curriculum? Yeah, thank you. I am used, Mr Chair, to addressing the House as well as yourself, so, so it is a habit that I have of actually speaking to the people that are, that, that are asking questions and so forth. However, um, because we only have the one speaker, I will take your advice on this matter. Um, so in terms of the question asked by the, the, the member for East Londonderry, I think it is critical that we do get um, our younger population on board with us. Um, the, the one thing that, that I despair of is still the amount of waste that is thrown on the side of our roads. So every country road you go up, there's cans of drink, used cans of drinks, there's um, papers from uh, food outlets and, and crisp bags and all sorts of things. And it's not appropriate. It shouldn't be happening. And education should uh, take that out of the system. So I think that we do need to encourage environment to be at the centre of education. I know that there are now GCSEs, for example, in, in land use and, and, and agriculture and so forth, and I think we need to encourage more of that. We need to encourage, particularly if there's going to be 
thousands and you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs potentially created across uh, the United Kingdom um, for this. Um, it is important that people are educated um, in a way that prepares them for those jobs. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, I'd also like to thank you for your statement and welcome it very much as the way forward indeed for our new green growth strategy. Thank you. I want to just ask a question in relation to machinery. What way do you intend to perhaps work with the machinery producers in the future in relation to perhaps lo um, looking at their energy efficiency, such as our tractors, you know, that guzzle up so, ma so much oil and diesel, etc., etc.? Well, thankfully, um, a lot of those tractors have become more fuel efficient over the, over the years, so your more, more modern tractor um, is actually more fuel efficient. And I know that many people don't, maybe don't like it, but the bigger the machine um, and the bigger the equipment that's behind it, um, the more energy efficient it is, and uh, therefore that is a good thing. So not having lots and lots of the smaller machines around and having a uh, uh, fewer machines, but bigger ones actually works better. And I should say that <clears throat> going forward, you know, as we look to elect electric cars and the opportunities that exist there, I suspect they don't exist to the same extent uh, for HGVs and indeed for, for, for tractors and agricultural machinery. And that's where we need to be looking at other opportunities such as hydrogen. And I welcome, for example, Wright Bus and Ballymena and the work that has been done there on developing hydrogen has been done for buses. I assume it can be done for, for tractors and lorries. And in terms of the circular economy, can we capture hydrogen um, for the RFD waste, the, the residual waste, um, resi uh, where, where we can derive fuel from that? And those are all areas that we need to look at. And that's how we can grow this economy and go forward in an environmentally sustainable way. We're 100 per cent of the material which could be described as waste has a useful purpose. Members, can I also encourage you to make sure your mic is pointing in an appropriate direction? And I call Joan Blair. Uh, Deputy Speaker, thank you. And can I, on behalf of Alliance, uh, also thank the Minister for the um, extensive statement, in particular the addressing therein of the remaining growing and global challenge of, of climate change. Um, I will be hoping, Deputy Speaker, that what has been called a, an economic revolution might also provide opportunities for an environmental protection revolution. In light of that, can I ask the Minister if the specific New Decade New Approach commitment to a Climate Change Act will also be included as we take forward green growth, and if that will be done in the context of looking at opportunities for uh, technologies, research and development and skills within that area. In the proposals of the NDN agreement for the establishment of the independent agency um, to form part of the possible outline of a future programme for government. And that would be no small task given the scope of the potential impacts and um, there are other issues that would need to be addressed. In terms of the opportunities that exist, I entirely agree with the member um, that this is a window of opportunity for us and should be seen as such. So, for example, as new agreements are done and new deals are done um, after the, the UK um, uh, moves on from the European Union, that could leave challenges for us in terms of imported food coming, coming in, into the UK, which is of a different standard than ours. The, the, the message that needs to go out to the general public is that this has been produced in a sustainable way sustainable in terms of animal welfare, sustainable in terms of environmental production, sustainable in terms of food miles, for example, sustainable in terms of how the people who have been employed in that industry have been treated um, in the processing of that, those goods. And that is something that if we can apply to whatever we produce in Northern Ireland, not just food, but to whatever we produce in Northern Ireland is something that can help us sell in a market as a premium product, because I do not want Northern Ireland competing at the bottom end 
I don't want us to be a commodity-based market. I want us to be a premium uh, producer of goods, which is recognised across the world as a premium producer of goods. Just for example, as German manufacturing is recognised as up there amongst the best in the world, I want whatever Northern Ireland produces to be recognised as amongst the best in the world, and people will pay a premium for that, and there will be a benefit um, to the entire economy and the people who work in that economy. I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Minister's statement how he has highlighted the important role farmers already play in protecting the environment and that we must continue to support our farmers in this work. How does the Minister see his department assisting farmers in the future? Thank you. There is a series of things that can be done. So clearly we have challenges around um, water management and because we are um, making you know, considerable use of the assets that exist, um, then that applies a degree of pressure. So <clears throat> helping um, with capital investment schemes, um, doing more research and development um, through AFPI and others um, is going to be very important. Um, we'll be looking at further tranches of the environmental farming scheme, um, good advice to farmers, and a wider rollout of good practice. Not reinventing the wheel um, is something which will be very important. And in all of this, we don't intend to reinvent the wheel where good practice exists. How do we actually harness that good practice? How do we encourage others to participate in that good practice? And how do we ensure um, that we can improve upon that where possible? And I know that the farming community will buy into that because we have so many innovative and excellent farmers in Northern Ireland. I call Declan McLear. Um, Graham Elgott, I thank the Minister for his wide-ranging statement. Uh, the Minister will be very well aware that his department is leading an environment strategy and indeed will come before the Chamber, I believe, next week, uh, looking for consent for an LCM on the Environment Bill. Can the Minister give any indication of where he, sits, uh, where he envis envisages that this green growth strategy fits within the environment strategy and the uh, Environment Bill? Graham Elgott. The Environment Bill is a necess necessity uh, to ensure that we don't leave gaps after leaving the European Union, but I don't believe that, that it stops there um, with the Environment Bill. And we need to be looking at the strategy, we need to be looking at this green growth strategy, and then we need to be looking at giving it resource and also legislative cover. So all of those things will be applied um, as, as we further develop uh, and understand uh, the route of direction that we're taking. I call Tom Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister today for his wide-ranging statement, the vision within green growth and the opportunities presented within it. And on that note, Minister, and I know you have touched on this um, uh, earlier on, but would you agree that in the context of producing environmental sustainable food, that Northern Ireland and indeed the UK are well placed in doing so? Therefore, uh, we should reduce our reliance on imported food, which we have little or no control over as to how it is produced. Um, I, I had a challenge some of the supermarkets during uh, the early part of COVID. Um, for their importation of goods. And I'll continue to do that. And I'll continue to make clear that you have a premium product on your doorstep that we need to make greater utilisation of. And this product is actually of higher value as a consequence of the standards that it's produced. So during COVID, uh, there was one particular weekend whenever Calais was proven a tad difficult and there was a panic about the not having enough food um, in the UK over the following week. And that is a demonstration of the importance of food security. And I know that there are some advisers in uh, number 10 who at the start of the year uh, were suggesting that they did not really need farming um, in the UK. And that is a nonsense of a suggestion for the environment. It is a nonsense of a suggestion for the public well-being. Sustainable food. Um, can and should be produced here, and we need to have the support to do that. 
and to ensure that we can go forward. We are not going to be cutting down rainforests, and we are not um, going to be engaging in those environmental uh, negative uh, activities that are happening in many other parts of the world in terms of producing food. And in order to do that, it will cost a bit more, and that needs to be recognised. But for the food security um, of this country, we need to ensure that we have as much food produced at home, at the local base, um, and import less if possible. I call Kiva Archibald. Um, and I thank the Minister for his statement and I, I welcome the ambition around green go growth and also in terms of the partnership working. Um, you have outlined a number of strands of work that fall across various sectors and it will not be any surprise to the Minister to hear me say climate legislation with binding sectoral targets would provide a framework for our strategies and programmes and I would urge him to, to expedite um, that. But in terms of the, the current work, has the Minister or will the Minister um, be working with the Economy Minister to ensure that the green growth strategy fits in with the economic recovery plan? Yes, I will be working with the Economy Minister, indeed all ministers, um, in, in this. This is a strategy that we brought to the Executive on an away day, I think it was in February, um, certainly before COVID struck. And we, we are, are keen to press ahead with this. And COVID has delayed it slightly, um, but that is that's a blip uh, in terms of this. Um, it is not going to prevent us um, carrying this out. And we are now wanting to focus uh, on this as we come out of COVID and focus on delivery. So, yes, the Economy Minister will be crucial, as indeed will the Infrastructure Minister, but every Minister will have a role in delivering this, and I will work with all of my executive colleagues in doing so. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and thank you, Minister, and congratulations on your policy statement. It's a really good start, uh, and I look forward to its further development. I'm also uh, pleased at your commitment to working with the other ministers in relation to this, because this is an all-government uh, approach. Uh, for our future. Uh, Minister, it is important that all um, departments support the Green Recovery Programme, but does the Minister um, share my concerns at the moment about the future of factory farming? It harms the environment and, and, and arguably bad for human health as well, as shown at the recent um, COVID-19 outbreaks in meat processing plants uh, within Germany, France, Spain, Wales and England. Are you concerned about this? Well, it all depends on what the terminology of factory farming is. Um, certainly, farms which um, have higher levels of, of livestock and, and have to employ additional people over and above the family, um, I would not consider to, to be factory farms. Um, some of the, the, the larger pork farms that we have in Northern Ireland um, and that are being developed um, can reduce the amounts of ammonia and, indeed, um, other uh, gases um, as a consequence of the significant investment that they are prepared to make. And sometimes we need to reflect on this, that you can have older systems that are in place or smaller systems, um, but they, per, per, for the output that they have, their environmental footprint is much larger. So, you know, we are not, we're not in a situation where, in the United States, for example, you could go to a farm which is 20,000 cows. That's, that is factory farming. Um, but we do have some larger farms. And some of those larger farms are carrying out best practice, and we need to recognise that, and not simply just to label something as a factory farm um, whenever best practice is, is, is being done. So let, let's look at everything in the round and judge, judge things on their merits. Um, as opposed to their scale, and in terms of the environmental impact that they may have um, uh, for the output that they have, that is something that we need to take judge in the round. I call Keith Buchanan. The Minister's for his very uh, detailed document. Just regarding on agri-food industry, which is a sector I worked with for many years, I'm proud to do so. What more practical steps do you think that sector could do to fit into your, your document or your roadmap? Um, well, I, I think that in terms of many of the, the, the factories, for example, uh, good practice um, needs to be throughout the system, and they need to identify a good practice from the very start of the process right through the, the entirety of it. 
So how they manage their waste, how they manage their effluence, um, what energy they're using, um, can they produce energy of their own, can they resource water of their own. All of these things um, are there. I know of, of, of facilities which are almost entirely circular, perhaps some who are entirely circular. Um, so that is something which is important. It is something which many of the, the, the businesses have been looking at, because 20 years ago it was not on the radar, but it is now on the radar and it is very important for them, and many are responding in positive ways. And it is a selling point. So I know facilities which are um, producing their own energy, um, chilling their own fridges, um, using um, some of that energy to, 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 to drive the, the lorries and vehicles that are transporting and so forth. And those are all excellent and innovative and are making a significant contribution uh, to the circular economy that we desire. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. I do, however, have concerns about the seriousness upon which he is judging the situation when he prefaces the statement saying he is not someone who is prone to declaring climate emergencies. Uh, this House declared a climate emergency, and it is a clear and present risk for us all, and I do not think it should be underplayed. Uh, my question is really in relation to the fact, and I would declare I was previously a member of Ards and North Dunborough Council and an employee of TransLink, of uh, the plans to incorporate this in, within the multi year programme for government and what engagement he plans to do with these other executive colleagues, including the Minister for Infrastructure, to ensure we have a coordinated approach which is incorporated within the programme for government. Well, we are very happy to work with uh, all of the other government departments, as, as, I, as I indicated to other members, um, and transportation is, is a very important one. However, I would say that COVID-19 has taught us all a lesson that we probably do not need to use as much transport, whether that be aeroplanes, cars, trains or buses, um, and that many of us can do much more work uh, from our homes. And that has been demonstrated um, to be something that, that, that we're capable of doing, and, and it's a very important um, demonstration because we have talked about working from home for years, and people were always a bit unsure about it. And the fact is that much of the work um, that we do can be monitored. Um, you know, the, you can see the outputs of the individuals, and it is not something which should be regarded as a negative by either business or government where it's achievable. So <clears throat> in terms of transportation, I want to see less of everything on our roads and more people um, working from home. And I think COVID-19 has awoken us to the possibilities that exist there. And I believe that again provides an opportunity for the economy in Northern Ireland because it is much more inexpensive to employ someone working from their home, be it in Hollywood or Hillsborough or wherever else, than those people um, sitting in an office in London, living in London, going through that transportation system. There are opportunities here for Northern Ireland, and we need to embrace those opportunities. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I thank, um, first of all, welcome the, minister, the Minister's announcement that he's not going to cut down the rainforests. I think the orangutans in Beaver Forest and Tully Moore will be relieved and pleased to hear that. Um, but can I, um, in the spirit of partnership, which I welcome, he, his statement included um, uh, stressing the importance of the spirit of partnership, and, and I do welcome that. Can I ask him then if he will ask his permanent secretary in the department to look at opportunities in relation to green growth that present themselves from the position that Northern Ireland finds itself in vis-à-vis -vis the protocol. He's talked about this himself in the past. I don't want to, to start another row with him in Brexit. We'll have lots of time for that in the future. But the, the European Green Deal involves the biggest market in the world, uh, one of the biggest markets in the world, announcing the biggest ever transition towards a low-carbon economy. How does the protocol enable us, our businesses and workers, to uh, avail of that, while also, yes, benefiting from the pan-UK frameworks and opportunities. Can you ask his department to look at those opportunities and ensure that they are reflected in the strategy? We will look at every opportunity that, that lies there, whether it is European or beyond the, the, sh the shores of the European Union. Um, we are very happy to look at whatever opportunities exist. Um, but you know, the, the, the policy that I, I indicated I wish to follow is that we are producing premium and the product that we, we, we are producing is at the top end of the market, not the bottom end of the market. 
and that's the markets that we need to be going after. So obviously parts of the European Union um, will fit that bill. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I'm deeply concerned at the emphasis on growth in this strategy. Why is it that the economy must always be at the centre of every discussion we have about sustainability and relentless growth the only lens through which we can view solutions? There must come a point when we seriously consider how much growth this planet can sustain. I do agree with the Minister in his opening sentence, though. It is hard to imagine a set of cir circumstances with more devastating global impacts than those we currently face. But if we open our eyes, we will see the other ongoing emergency that threatens the lives of millions more, an emergency that is set to destabilise and destroy entire economies. So in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were brave enough to implement unthinkable changes overnight to protect people, and we did make the impossible possible. Will the Minister please continue to be brave enough and implement the actual change needed so that we can halt the climate breaking down and turn this strategy into a real Green New Deal? Well, I suppose the, the emphasis on growth, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, in terms of the environment, is to demonstrate that we can do both in conjunction with each other. Because if we don't have growth, we have retraction. And if we have retraction, we have unemployment. And if we have unemployment, we have hardship and misery. And I am not someone who is going to be promoting hardship and misery. If that's the policy of the Green Party, to make people unemployed, to have hardship, and misery and compare the challenges that we face environmentally with COVID-19. The response to COVID-19 was a response um, at a moment and is a temporary response to that particular crisis because no government in the world can sustain what is currently happening. The borrowing of tens of billions of pounds and dollars and trillions and all of that there, that is not sustainable. And if the Green Party think it's as sustainable as an environmental solution, as opposed to reducing greenhouse gases, reducing carbon, reducing methane, reducing ammonia, and at the same time allowing businesses to grow and create jobs and create opportunity and create wealth, which should then be invested in health and education and infrastructure, that's my way. The Green Party may want to have some sort of um, trashed place. I don't want that. I want something which is positive, forward-looking, and a vibrant Northern Ireland going forward. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. How do we miss Sammy Wilson at a time like this to give a reality check on this misty-eyed, aspirational state? Deputy Speaker, I don't say that there aren't worthwhile things in here. There are. But I do have to ask the Minister, where is the audit of the cost of what is called green growth or some other fancy title? In terms of existing jobs, in terms of setup costs, in terms of costs piled upon the consumer? I have heard again today much praise of a renewable sector, but what I seldom hear is the resulting costs on the consumer of funding and subsidising the renewable sector. So I ask the Minister, where is the balance sheet? Will he produce a balance sheet of cost as against benefit on these aspirational proposals? Well, I thank the member for the question, and in relation to it, um, we are in a circumstance where actually a lot of the actions that have been taken have been cost neutral or marginal costs, and the benefits have been phenomenal. And the member could do well to reflect upon that. So we have significant organisations who have engaged in partnerships with us, 
in terms of prosperity agreements, not because um, it's misty eyed, but because it's economically beneficial to the company and because it helps that company sustain its position in the market, it helps it to continue to provide jobs. Some of these things uh, will actually uh, create economies uh, within those companies. I don't know if the member is suggesting that it's a good idea to you know, use, you know, use plastic produced by oil once and then put it into the ground um, where it still exists a thousand years later. I don't know whether the member thinks it's a good idea uh, to have waste from the agri sector going into waterways. Most farmers don't, don't believe that. The vast majority of farmers don't want it. Um, so I'm not sure where the member is coming from. I don't know whether the member thinks that you know, going forward in the next 100 years um, that using energy, uh, which is produced by combustion, as opposed to the energy that exists around us, is a good idea. I know for one thing, I'd much prefer to use energy which is harvested on the Irish Sea or the Atlantic Ocean or in the hills of County Tyrone than use gas that's coming from Russia, from Mr Putin, or use oil that's coming from Iran. I'd much prefer to have that energy security that we can have here from our own sources and the benefits uh, to the, the, the environment are there to be seen. So I don't think it's a particularly logical route that the member is going down. I call Jerry Carl. I'm sure the, the teachers probably would miss Sammy Wilson with his recent comments, but maybe that's for another day. Um, the IEA have stated that we have six months to change the course uh, uh, to avoid the climate catastrophe. The next three years will uh, shape. Uh, the next 30 years in terms of action taken or action not taken. I want to ask the Minister about a just transition when we uh, are likely to see highly skilled workers in Bombardier, in Thompson uh, or Oseaton likely to lose their jobs. What steps will his department uh, take to ensure that workers aren't thrown under the bus because of COVID-19 or the likely economic crisis that's to, that's to come to ensure their skills and their efforts can be used uh, and utilised to protect the environment so that we do have a just transition? Well, I think it's hugely unfortunate those um, job losses are happening. Um, and unfortunately, there is a reality, and, and COVID has driven home that reality in terms of the aerospace industry, that there's going to be radical change there. And we have a specialist aerospace um, industry here in Northern Ireland, and that's a consequence that that uh, has come about. And we really need to be looking at how we can address that, how we can support those workers and provide them high-quality jobs, maybe in other industries which are not under the same threat. So as we come out of COVID, um, and I believe that we'll see many job losses over the course of the next number of weeks and months. But as we come out of COVID. We need to be very flexible, fast on our feet, uh, to demonstrate how we can uh, create other opportunities uh, for people who are losing their jobs at this time. I call John Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his um, statement and for his um, answers so far? I agree entirely with the member from East London Derry in terms of um, saying an education process for young people to try and encourage them to think more green in terms of recycling and, and in protecting our environment. And I agree entirely with you about my loathing, and I'm sure all members' loathing, of dumping. Um, it's a growing issue in my constituency of East Antrim, as is protecting our waterways. And you refer to that in your statement as well. Do you support further sanctions and regulations to try and tackle this? Because it is starting to happen on an industrial scale, and I, I do want to see more in terms of protecting our, our countryside areas, Minister. Well, NIA always seek um, to recover the costs that are involved, um, and it is for the courts then to, to impose the fines. And I think that members um, quite often have indicated their dissatisfaction with that. Um, I think the scale of the fines uh, that can be imposed are quite significant. Uh, but that is not always utilised. Uh, so that, that is an issue that, that the member rightly raises. Um, I am not in the position to impose fines. Um, we set the law, uh, others actually administer it, and it is for the people who administer the law um, to impose the appropriate fines for, for, uh, and sanctions um, for the activities that have brought them before the court. Is there any other member who has yet to ask the question? 
That being the case, that concludes questions to the Minister on his statement. Uh, I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments whilst a temporary speaker takes the chair.